So our next presenter is uh, Ken Donnelly. Ken's the president of Beyond Atti Attitude Consulting, a Canadian-owned firm with clients across Canada and around the world. Ken has been working with government and non-governmental organizations to foster positive individual behaviors for more than two <coughs> decades, primarily in the areas of environment, health, and occupational health and safety. He has more than 20 years' experience in community engagement and strategic planning. Ken Donnelly. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Hey, there's a picture of me right here. Um, thanks. Uh, it's a, it's a, a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be here. I've learned a lot today um, from the previous speakers. Um, Delia, I still have to figure out, though. I have to change my whole... I thought I knew a lot about nutrition, and apparently I didn't, so I need to make some big changes. Um, but some of the things that I'm going to be talking about today can apply to um, some of the things that uh, have been said before me by people like Delia, um, because I'm going to be talking about behavior change. But before I do, I'd just like you to bear with me for a second. I just ask you to put up your hand if you believe that giving blood is a good thing to do, that blood donation is a good thing to do. You support blood donation? Okay, virtually everybody. Why? Can you tell me a reason why? So he's been a recipient seven, recipient seven or eight times. Well, that would convince me, that's for sure. Anybody over here? Anybody else? Reason that giving blood is a good thing? Good idea? How about you? Help could help save lives. I, I always ask people at the beginning of my seminars if they think giving blood is a good idea. I've been doing that for, since 2000 when I started my seminars. And virtually everybody always says, yes, giving blood is a good idea. And people can readily say why. They're very aware of the benefits of giving blood. But I want to ask people now, and I want you to answer very honestly. Put up your hand, those people who have given blood in the last month. Okay, and then last, keep your hands up, last six months, last year, let's say last five years, okay? All right, so there's some, quite a few hands up, and there's a lot of hands that aren't up. And the thing is that, in Canada, although from my somewhat scientific survey, I would say that virtually 100% of people have the attitude that giving blood is a good idea, and about 100% of people are aware of all of the benefits of giving blood. They can readily shout them out. Only 3.5% of Canadians donate blood. And it's about the same in the United States, and it's about the same in the UK, and it's about the same in Trinidad, and those are countries that I've spoken in, so I've looked it up in those, in those countries. Now, only about half of Canadians can give blood. So, but still, the only 3.5% of Canadians are giving blood when 50% can. All right? Even though they, they believe it's a good thing. And this is what I'm going to talk about today. And I'm going to give you some tips on how to bridge the gap between attitude and awareness and behavior. Because we can't make the assumption that just because somebody thinks something is the right thing to do and they know all the reasons why they should do it, that they'll actually do it. Because there's all kinds of examples of that not happening. So this is titled Doctors Washing Hands. It's not just doctors, but medical professionals. Now doctors and, med and medical professionals nurses and others, they go to school for a long, long, long time and they learn all about the importance of washing their hands and communicable diseases and all of those things. They probably know more about it than any of us here. So I would say that out of medical professionals, 100% of them, I think it's fair to say, would have the attitude that it's really important when you're going from one patient to another to wash your hands. And they would be aware of all the reasons. They'd know that there's communicable diseases, all of these things. They might have gotten some fluid on their hands when they were talking, or when they were examining one patient, and they can't transfer that to another patient. So they're very aware of that. So let's just say that it's 100% awareness. But a study where they watched, where the researchers watched in several medical facilities, 
the do what the doctors and nurses and other medical practitioners were doing, were they complying with the hand washing protocols that had been established? 12%. 12%. So you know what's worse? That study was done in Victoria. And it was only released about four years ago. And if you Google hand washing uh, protocol compliance in Canada, you'll find that this is a problem right across the country. I'm from Nova Scotia. In uh, Sydney, a whole bunch of people died at the hospital there about three years ago, and it was because they had the, uh, one of those ter terrible communicable, communicable viruses, and it was passed because the doctors and nurses were not washing their hands and, f and following the protocols between going from one uh, person to another, one patient to another. So we can't assume that if we tell somebody that it's important that they're going to adopt a safety behavior and tell them all the reasons why, we cannot assume that it's going to be done. So I'm going to talk to you about that, because we should know better, right? But we do things like this. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to talk to you about attitude and awareness, and I'm going to talk to you about tools. It's using behavioral psychology in order to bridge the gap between attitude and awareness and behavior. And those tools are research and small questions, developing commitment strategies, using prompts to remind people, and establishing social norms. And a shout out to the guy with the Green Bay Packers uh, gear on, all right. We should all have, it. we can always be proud to wear your Green Bay Packers gear. Uh, research. Why do um, only 3.5% of Canadians give blood? Why, would that, why is that? We have to find out. Why don't lobster fishermen, it's a big, where I live, it's a big issue. Lobster fishermen, we lose them every year. They don't wear life jackets. So they're out in the boats and they fall over into the cold Atlantic. And we lose them. Why don't doctors wash their hands? There's all kinds of different uh, examples. My point to you is that you have to do research. You can't just make assumptions. If you're trying to figure out why people aren't acting safely in the forest, you can't just make assumptions. Now, sometimes as supervisors or safety officers or the people who are supposed to be in charge, there's a bit of ego here, and we think we should know. We ought to know. So we project our knowledge on somebody else. But until you ask people why they're doing these behaviors or why, not, why they're not performing the behaviors you want them to, you really don't know. And I have done research all across Canada on different behaviors. I've done it in the UK, internationally. And I learned a long time ago not to make assumptions. And I ask you not to make those assumptions when you're trying to make sure that you get behavior change. You have to determine the barriers that those people are presenting to you for the reason why they are not adopting the behaviors that you want adopted. So the number one thing, if, if you only leave, and it's been a long day, and if you only leave with one message from what I'm saying to you today is you cannot assume that somebody is going to adopt a behavior because they know it's the right thing to do and they have and they have they know all the reasons why it's the right thing to do so when we do literature reviews uh, sorry when we do research we typically do literature reviews um, and we do surveys we do focus groups and we and we often do observations so I'm working with the BC Forest Safety Council now on a project where we're trying to increase the adoption of the three-point contact entrance and exit uh, behavior. And we've done a whole bunch of research on this. And in fact, on uh, Monday, I'm doing some training in Prince George for some of the people that will be trying to promote this further. And what we've done is we did some literature reviews. We got some good information on what's uh, happening in other areas. Um, we, we did some surveying, and some of you may have participated in that survey. Actually, it was an online survey that we did uh, early this year, and it checked to see if people were doing it, if they thought... That, first of all, we asked them if they knew what three-point contact was. I'm glad to say virtually everybody said yes. Then we asked them to tell us what it was, and virtually everybody was correct, which is fantastic, because I've worked on a lot of different issues, and sometimes when you ask those questions, they just don't know. 
they, they just don't understand it. But everybody understands it. And then we ask people if they were doing it, and they were, we asked them if their coworkers did it. Most people said, yes, I do it most of the time, but my coworkers don't seem to all the time. We, we see that kind of thing. It's a research technique. We also put a camera up somewhere. I won't tell you where. But we put a camera up, and we videotaped for eight hours on two separate days, and we watched people getting in and out of vehicles. And then we reviewed the tape, just like on Monday Night Football, and we, and we checked to see if they were doing it properly. So we've got the observations. We have what people think they're doing, but we actually have some observations. So anyway, so that's the kind of research that we've done. And when you do this research, what you want to find out is the barriers. So what we determined from what people said in the survey and what we observed when we videotaped is that drivers seem to be in a hurry quite often. They, there, there's a greater compliance, as you can see at the bottom there, there's a greater um, compliance on entering the vehicle, uh, but when people are getting out, the compliance isn't that great. I don't know if that's partly because you have to, you know, it's difficult sometimes to haul yourself up there and you might need three point, points of contact to get up there where gravity helps you on the way down. Um, but we found that people seem to be in a hurry. Uh, we asked people that, um, why others wouldn't um, necessarily use three point contact and they felt it was because people thought they just weren't going to get hurt. Some people thought they, they don't think it is important. And many people said they just forget. Pull in to get gas or something, or pull into a way scale, where, whatever you might be doing, and you open the, open the door and jump out and not really think about it. So, so those are the, some of the barriers that we found in order that uh, prevented people from doing it. So the next thing you do when you're working on this behavior change model is to remove the barriers. Sometimes you get systemic barriers. Um, for instance, with recycling, I've worked a lot on waste management programs. It's hard to get people to recycle if there's no recycling program available, or if the recycling depot is 10 miles away, and that sort of thing. Sometimes there's systemic barriers, and somebody else has to step in and fix the barriers. But on the ones that we've seen for three-point contact, for the most part, it is uh, uh, barriers that can be removed by the individual. So <clears throat> we remove barriers. The way we do that, um, it, it, and by the way, this is all, um, this technique is, is community-based social marketing, and you can look up community-based social marketing, this application of behavioral psychology to behavior change. And what, what, uh, what we do is we go out in the field in pilot projects, and we talk to people. So let's just say we go to a gas station where, where uh, big rigs are being uh, fueled up, and we stop and we talk to the drivers. And, and a driver jumps out and we walk up and say, you know, we just noticed that you, uh, you, know, you seem to be in a hurry or something, you didn't use three-point contact, can you tell me why? And, they, and usually the person will throw up a barrier. So, well, I'm in a hurry. Well, you, you know, are you really in that much of a hurry? It would only probably take a couple seconds and, and you could be, be safer. And we just remove those barriers. We just slowly remove the barriers. Give them little reminders. I'm going to talk about reminders in a second. Give them little reminders that remind them of the behavior that they're supposed to do. And, and when, once we get them to remove, and once we've taken all those barriers away, because if, if I say, look, it's only going to take you another two, three or, two or three seconds, that's really not a problem, is it? And the person says, no, no, you're right. Well, that barrier is gone. As soon as there's no barriers gone, then we ask them for a commitment. And I'll explain that in a second. So, so we've done research. And we've moved, and, and, we're, and I've told you how we ad, um, address behaviors. Sorry, barriers. So I want to talk to you about small questions. You might ask yourself, well, why are you dealing with three-point contact when there's other things we've heard, heard about today, some behaviors that are much more dangerous, right? Things that people should be doing that could prevent fatalities. And, and, uh, you know, may, and it's been said a couple of times, people have asked, well, why? Are you doing three-point contact because there's more serious uh, or bigger fish to fry, perhaps? And the thing is, one of the reasons is the small question, and this is part of behavioral psychology. And as an example, there was uh, in, a, in some research, there was people like this fellow went over into a neighborhood, and they knocked on everybody's door. When somebody came to the door, they said hi. There's there's a few of them. Said hi. 
Um, I'm from a group that supports safe driving in our community. Do you support safe driving in our community? Well, of course, of course anybody, everybody pretty well says yes. You're not going to say, well, no, I like NASCAR right in front of my yard while my kids are playing. So, so most people say yes. And then they say, well, they said, rather, they said, well, we'd ask you to put up one of these little signs that we have that says that you support safe driving in our community. It's kind of like the block parent approach. And we want to have as many of these little signs up as possible to show people that this community is solidly behind safe driving. Fine, right? So most people put the signs up in their window or on their door. Not a big deal. So then, about a month later, some other people came by, also on the research team, but they came by and they knocked on the people's doors. And they said, do you support safe driving? And the person said, well, yes, of course I do. I have this sign in my window. It says I support safe driving. The person, would said, the person said, that's fantastic. We would like to erect a full-size, city-size billboard on your front lawn that says that we support safe driving. And it looks like this. And they showed him a picture like this. And said, this is what your house will look like. And you can barely see the corner of it. Right? And they said, can we do this? Can we put this on your front lawn? So it, when you do this kind of research, you have to have a control group, too. So there was another group of people, about 250 people. And they went, they didn't go and ask the small question. They didn't ask them to put the little sign up. They just went to the house and said, do you believe in, in safe driving? They said, yes. Well, can we put a billboard on your lawn? So there are two groups. Believe it or not, the, the second group, the one that was not asked first, 2% actually said, yes, you can put a, the billboard on my front lawn. So, but the people that were asked the small question first, or as I call it, the gateway behavior, wait for it here, those people, 76% of them said, yes, you can put the billboard on my lawn. And that's the difference between the, small, the um, small question being asked first or not being asked. So I call them gateway behaviors. You can just imagine when the spouse, spouse gets home and says, uh, somebody came to the door and asked if we could have a billboard on our front lawn. Um, so there were no billboards put up. Uh, they went around and explained to people after there was part of research. But this is an important thing. So if we can get people to um, adopt some of these smaller behaviors, there, there's, it's a psychological phenomenon that people feel, they see themselves differently. Sorry about that. They see themselves differently. And so they see themselves as people who will um, perform that behavior and they do it. So they find it very difficult later on not to. All right. The second thing is commitment. Now, Behavioral psychology tells us that people want to be seen to be consistent with what they say to others. It's very important in our society. If I say that I'm going to do something and then I don't do it, you all are going to look really badly upon me because I, I've said one thing and I haven't done another. So that's a very important principle in behavioral psychology. So if we can say, get people to, to agree that they're a recycler or that they compost or they donate blood, or they don't idle their vehicles, these are all projects I've worked on, if we can get them to change their self-perception, then it's, we know that the behavior will follow. So we seek to get commitment from people on these behaviors. So I'll just give you another example, a research example. In this um, research, this, uh, there's a fellow, he's at a beach, and he has with him a blanket, a radio, and a cigarette. And he'd walk along the beach, and he'd find somebody who was relaxing on the beach, and then near them, but not new, too near them, so that it was weird or anything, but near them, he would spread out the blanket, put his radio down, and using the cigarette just as a prop, walk over to the person and say, do you have a light? Just, just to have a reason to interact. And whether the person said yes or no, he would say, OK, I'm just going to go over to this building. Would you mind watching my radio? And he would go and walk, walk behind where the washrooms were. And he, a few minutes later, somebody that was doing the research with him 
would come along, walk along, stop, grab the radio and run. And the question was to see how many people would take some sort of action, either yell or run after the person or whatever. Now, again, you have to have a control group. So in this research, he would do, do it for a whole bunch of other people, he would do the same thing. He'd put the blanket down, put the radio down, walk over to the person, do you have a light? And whether the person said yes or no, he wouldn't ask them if they'd watch the radio. He'd just walk over behind the building. So the only difference between the two groups is one was asked, will you watch the radio? And the other wasn't. So what happened? Well, for those people who are not asked, about one in five, 20% of those people either yelled or chased after the person and said, hey, that's not your radio. But for those people that gave a commitment to watch the radio, 19 out of 20, 95% took action. The only difference being they had made a commitment to take that action or to watch the radio. So, you know, when I, I travel a lot um, and uh, I'm in airports a lot, I used to always, if I had to go to the washroom, I used to always take all my bags, all my carry-on stuff and everything and go in the washroom with it. Afraid either that somebody would steal it up or the RCMP would come and blow it up or something. Um, but uh, now I just go to somebody nearby and I say, would you watch my stuff? And I say it in a loud enough voice that everybody around can hear so that that person has made a commitment not to me but also to the other people because that's much, much stronger. <laughs> much stronger. And that's a scientific fact. It's much stronger. I'll explain that in a second. So, and then I can go to the washroom and um, come back and everything's still there. So the thing is we get people to make commitments and what we do, we know for a fact that a, public, or a verbal commitment has a certain strength, a written commitment is much stronger, and a public commitment is stronger still. So when we do interventions, what we do is, as, as I said before, we ask people, we talk to people, and then we remove the barriers, like saying, well, you know, are you really in that much of a hurry? And, and uh, well, here's a sticker that would help you remember if, um, in order to, um, to perform the behavior. And, we, and finally, after breaking down all those uh, barriers, we say, so can we count on you, you know, doing, using three-point con contact later on? And, and really, there's no reason not to anymore. And so the person says yes. And that verbal commitment gets you, um, gets you a lot. But what we typically do then is say, that's fantastic. We're keeping a list of all of the people who are committed to this safe behavior. So can, can you just add your name to the list? And we have a sheet of paper that looks like a petition. And we just get them to add their name. And that is a written commitment. And the written commitments are much, much, much stronger than verbal commitments. And then what we typically do, and may, what we may do on, in this one, for instance, is we might get, try and get a sticker on the vehicle. And the sticker may say that I always exit and, ent and en enter the vehicle with three-point contact, something like that. But some sort of public commitment. One we do for idling, we tr I work on projects in order to reduce engine idling. We put, get people to put stickers on their windshield, on, on the front windshield, on the curb side that says this car does not uh, uh, idle its engine. So when people are parked, they know that that sticker is right there and somebody walking down the street can see it. Right? So, so public commitments are much, much, much stronger than the written commitments, which are stronger still than verbal commitments. The next thing is prompts. You have to remind people. And prompts, we forget lots of different things. We pick up, forget to pick up our dry cleaning. We forget to pick up milk and bread. There's a fellow in, uh, on Quinpool Street, which is pretty, Quinpool Avenue, which is a pretty busy, um, uh, thoroughfare in Halifax, there's a guy that has a, a um, gas station there and he has one of those portable signs that you can change the letters on and he always puts funny things on there. And every so often it's, um, your wife called, don't forget to pick up the milk, the bread, the dry cleaning and all of that because men are horrible at remembering these things and it's a sort of a public service announcement for all of us men. But what we do though now is that we all have these smartphones or um, and we used to have cal written calendars, and some people still do, so that we can remember the appointments that we have to make. And we, we, we have, prompts are simply reminders. What You see them a lot, don't see any here, but you see them a lot in businesses where at the exit, 
it, it will say last person out, turn out the lights, right? Or last person out, turn off the coffee pot. Now, the important thing is that's the place to put, put it because at the exit because the last person, if the sign is over by the coffee pot way in the back in the kitchen, the last person going out doesn't know whether or not the coffee pot's on and is unlikely to go back, go back and check. The, uh, sorry, sorry the, the person going out is not going to be reminded whether or not the coffee pot is on. Um, so it, it is, it's quite likely to forget. So you want to put the sign right at the door when the person's going out and also to turn off the lights. I have a client I was doing some work for and they have a boardroom that actually has a balcony in Halifax. And the balcony is way over on one side of the room and by the door it says last one out, please make sure this door is closed. But it's so far from the actual en entrance and exit to the, um, to the boardroom, it just doesn't make any sense. So I got them to move it. So prompts are reminders. Um, like I say, the turn off the lights or the coffee pots. Now, this one, put the toilet seat down. I went to a friend's house and uh, after playing golf with them, had a beer or two with them, went into the washroom, lifted up the toilet seat, and his wife had put a little sign, said put the toilet seat down. And it was in the perfect place because it was, when you're standing there, it was right on the thing. Like, I should have printed these up and sold them. I could have retired a long time ago because half the population pretty well would buy them. And, um, but it would be exactly where you need it at the time that you need it. And drumming that in, put the toilet seat down, put the toilet seat down all the time, and I've heard it quite a bit, um, that doesn't work as well as having a sign in the right place at the right time. So they're simple and effective, and they should always be placed at the proper place. No, at, at, at the, in the proper space. This one from, uh, this is from on Jasper Street in um, uh, Edmonton. And we all, we've all seen the advertising campaigns on radio and television that say, call before you dig. And that's fine, but when you go to dig, unless the TV happens to be right in front of you, playing that ad, you're not going to remember, there's a good chance you won't remember. But there are power lines right here, so Atco put up a sign that said, call us before you dig, because they're, they're right here. That makes sense. So those are prompts and reminders. They're very, very simple. Most people that work in communications, when I get to this part, they'll say, yeah, well, I, I, do, I do prompts, and uh, we do reminders, we do stickers, we do magnets, we do all of these things. Yes, most people have done it, but it's very important to recognize how to do it properly for recycling, for instance. It doesn't make any sense to uh, have the material out in the garage or in a drawer or something. So usually those kinds of materials are designed to be stuck to a fridge or put somewhere else in the kitchen where um, most of the recycling is done. So if somebody is looking at a piece of plastic and says, ah, can I recycle this or not? They can just open a drawer or look on the kitchen door and say, oh yeah, oh, yeah the information's right there. If it's on a website, they're not going to go look for it. If it's on a brochure that was mailed to them a long time ago or they picked up somewhere when some good meaning person handed it to them, they've got to go look, search for the brochure. Unlikely, the plastic bottle is going to go in the garbage. So you need to have it in the right place at the right time. All right, so, but once you get these things in place, and, and for three-point contact, let's just say that then wh where we are is we've got people to agree to, uh, um, to three-point contact, and we may, let's just say we have a little sticker on the side of the, um, on the outside of the vehicle, it just shows a little diagram of what a three-point contact which, as you're getting in, and maybe a little uh, um, sticker on the window, the, uh, the driver's window at the bottom that just shows the same thing for getting out. It's, it's a little reminder, um, and, and, uh, and we're good to go. What we want to establish when we do behavior change is to establish social norms, because social norms are very, very pow powerful. Who remembers this? This is an age it gives you an idea of your age. Put up your hand if you, if you remember having one of these in your living room when you were growing up. Yeah. So that's a pedestal ashtray, right? People of my vintage remember that every household had a pedestal ashtray. It was part of the furniture. You had a TV and a pedestal ashtray, right? And a washroom. No, we didn't all have washrooms, but, but we had a pedestal ashtray. And that's because back when I was a, you know, a teenager, Smoking was so prevalent that a host always had ashtrays 
for the people that came to the house. You had to. And, you'd, and I remember when I was a kid reading in, in uh, uh, Reader's Digest that when there's a party, the man's job should be to go around and empty the ashtrays all the time so that they'd have clean ashtrays. Because guess, can you imagine having to put the ashes out in a dirty ashtray? So, so, so everybody, and people would walk into somebody's house and if they wanted to smoke, they smoked. And they used the ashtray, that was the way it was there. Well now, people don't smoke in other people's homes. And there was a transition time when people asked if it was okay. Do you mind if I smoke? So we went from a social norm in my lifetime in the last, say, 30 years, we went from a social norm where it was absolutely fine to smoke in somebody else's house and that person was not to object to you smoking in your house. And we've gone the absolute the other way where nobody, m most places, unless the, in the household they, they are smokers, that nobody would light up a cigarette in somebody else's home, go outside and do it instead. So that social norm has changed completely. Recycling. Over the same time period, hardly anybody recycled back 30 years ago, 25 years ago. And now recycling is, is everywhere. And people find it difficult if they're at, they've got a bottle of water or a bottle of pop and they've just finished it and they're out in a public place or they're in a mall or whatever and they want it, where do I put it? Because they don't want to be putting it in the garbage. So they're looking for a place where they can recycle it because that's the social norm. Kids, I, t I do a lot of waste management work, I talk to kids, they can't imagine that at one time those things went in the garbage. They can't fathom it. So the social norm has changed. Elevators. Woe behold the person who gets in an elevator and turns around and looks at the other people. You don't do that. You all stand forward, right, and, and face the door and either look at the floor or look at the numbers. Make sure you don't make eye contact with somebody else. Now, when I've done my workshops in the UK, I found out that this is not an issue in the UK. So I'd mentioned this and they'd say, what? And in the UK, they're fine, absolutely fine with turning around. Everybody can face whatever way they want. But here, we all turn and we face the right elevator way. When I took, I was talking to somebody earlier, when I took my uh, chainsaw course when I was 18, um, most of that safety equipment wasn't part of it. You know, I learned a lot of uh, important things, how to try and stop kickbacks from happening, but it, it wasn't to wear all that safety equipment, not at all. So things have changed. We have social, social norms change, and they're really important. Now, this will, the men in the audience will understand this. There is a certain social norm, some etiquette, around urinals. So I notice there's three urinals in the washroom. There Actually, there's some more in the back. But when you walk in, and just to the left, there's three urinals. If you are the first person to go in, there are two urinals which it's OK to choose, and one you absolutely ch shall not choose. You don't choose the middle one, because then you're going to be too close to the next person that comes in. So if we, we call them one, two, three, left, right, one is OK, three is OK, and you're a jerk if you pick two. So. Right? I, I was in the washroom, actually, at, earlier at lunch. I picked one, and another guy came in, and I wondered what was going to happen, and he sort of looked around a bit, and then he went right to three. So, <laughs> so this is the etiquette. It's a, it's a social norm. The other thing is, and I wish I'd remember it, in the summer, don't use urinals when you've got your flip-flops on, but I, anyway. <laughs> All right, so some more research. Um, who's familiar with, who's here has been in a focus group before? So in focus groups, typically what happens is you have a facilitator, and then you have about eight people in a focus group and those eight people, the facilitator asks questions and they record the answers, right? Well, in this research, what they set up was fake, a fake focus group. And there were, um, the facilitator was a fake facilitator and seven of the eight people who were in the focus group were fake too and they were all just in on the research, okay? And then one poor person didn't realize it, but that person was the person being studied 
and didn't realize that it was just a sham, right? So what the facilitator did was, you know, everybody filed in and the facilitator started asking questions and you know, ask how they were and all that stuff. And eventually the facilita facilitator puts up a picture like this and we're going to pretend that you are the one that's not in on the gag. You don't realize it. And the facilitator says, of those, uh, of A, B, and C, which line is the same length as X? And he turns to the first person and you say C. And then, because and you, you're all in on it, right? It's all Peter's time. You say C, you say C, you say C, you say C, you say C. And then I turn to you and say, which is it? 75% of the time, when asked that question, the person said C. 75, they did that over and over. Because there's so much, the, the social norm is to say C, so people say C, even though anybody, idiot, can tell that it's B. So the social norm, that peer pressure is stronger than our desire not to look like an idiot. So that's the, that, so peer pressure is a very, very powerful uh, component of community-based social marketing, of behavior change, because if we can get people to change those behaviors, that's why if you, if it is difficult to put that pop bottle into a garbage can at the mall rather than a recycling bin if there's one nearby, because you know that people might be looking at you thinking, why are you doing that? Everybody knows you're supposed to recycle that, right? So social norms are really important. Now, the, the other thing is, the, social, the reason social norms are really important is that, and I can't go into a whole bunch of detail on this, but this pyramid gives you an example of conscious behavior, social behavior, and systems behavior, or as is often called recently as unconscious behavior. So, the conscious choice, we only have a certain number of brain cycles that we can use um, when, we're, when we're awake in order to do conscious choice. So, and just as an example, um, how many people have driven to work in the morning, gotten there and thought, how the hell did I get here? <laughs> yeah, see, a lot of people. I don't remember driving to work, really. And it's because we go on automatic pilot when we're doing things that we've done a lot before, right? If you've got, you've got a pen uh, handy and a piece of paper in front of you, just sign your name. Just, just take a moment. Try it. Don't be shy. Nothing bad will happen. I'll give on a blank check would be good. But but just just sign your name, okay. Now when you're done, near it, beside it, above it, below it, whatever. Looking at the at the signature you just did, try and copy it. Try and copy your signature nearby. Don't just scrawl it. Just try and copy the one you just made. And it becomes very difficult to get it exactly right. Because to just sign, we do that all the time. You can sign your signature, and it'll look, pretty well look the same every time. But to actually try and copy it, now you're thinking, and it's much, much harder to do. And that's because it's a, it's a conscious behavior. Now, if, in sports a lot now, um, golf, I'm an avid golfer, and what they teach you in golf now is to, get, to use unconscious behavior. So that you practice your putting over and over and over. And practice it and get that stroke down. So that when it comes to time to make your putt, you, you have a routine, you look at it, you step up, go one, two, three, bang, and hit it in the hole. Because when you're thinking about it, going, okay, I can't open my hands, I can't close my hands, I have to take it straight back, and I can't hit, hit it too far, and all of that, you're doomed for failure because you're working on the conscious choice part rather than the, the uh, unconscious part. And so in between there is the social behavior. And when we um, don't smoke in somebody's home right now, we don't, sit, we don't go in there and go, oh, should I smoke in their home? Uh, well, they might not say anything if I do, but then if they do say something, geez, they might be really mad and not let me come back. So, so you, ha you don't do that, right? You just know that you're not supposed to smoke in, in there. So can, when we can establish social norms, I call it the Shangri-La of behavior change, um, then all we have to do, we don't have to go back and convince people anymore. We just have to kind of maintain it with the, uh, um, with the prompts and reminders and that sort of thing.
Doug McKenzie Moore, who is the um, person, if you go to www.cbsm.com, you can learn a lot more about community-based social marketing. Uh, Doug McKenzie Moore is a, was a professor at St. Thomas University in New Brunswick, and he established this, and I, I've worked a lot with Doug over the years, but back around 92, he uh, coined this term, community-based social marketing, uh, um, to uh, describe a, 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 this toolkit that I've uh, presented to, to you, actually. Um, although there's a lot more detail than I could give in 45 minutes, but he, uh, he um, coined that phrase and, um, and put this toolkit together of proven behavioral psychology um, tools that can be used in order to foster uh, preferred behaviors. So, um, and Doug, when he was uh, teaching as a professor, what he used to do is he'd have uh, his students break social norms and report on it as part of their project. And he said they hated it. They absolutely hated it because it's, it's really difficult, of course, to break social norms. So what Doug, um, Doug tells the story of this one student that he had, this young lady, and she was pregnant. She was very visibly pregnant, about six or seven months pregnant. And what she did was she invited a bunch of her friends to a restaurant for, for uh, um, dinner one night. And they all got together. And, but she went early and she told the waitress that when I get, when people come in, please come around and ask us for our drink orders. And ask me last. And when you ask me, I'm going to say rum and coke. But just bring me a coke. So the waitress came around, asked everybody, all, the, uh, all her friends, all the, and they were all uh, female, what they wanted. And they all ordered, you know, wine, whatever it, it was. When it came to her, she said, I'll have a rum and coke. Her friends freaked out. So you can't drink. You're pregnant. Six, seven months pregnant. And then the drinks came, and they're all staring at her, right? And she put the thing to her lips. And then some of them left the restaurant, stomped out, angry. Others just gave her heck all through the whole dinner. And because of the research, of course, she couldn't say anything. So she told them the next day and had to document it. But that's a very powerful social norm. Now, when I was a kid, that w I guess that medical knowledge wasn't there. So um, that often happened. Um, that people would uh, smoke and drink, actually, when they were pregnant. Might explain something <laughs> for me, anyways. But <laughs> So right now, um, you may have seen on the, uh, um, on the radio and on the news that Canadian Blood Services has a real problem. And, and I, I heard it last night, too, right here in BC, is that the current blood inventory is very, very low. And they're trying to get people out to donate blood. And we all know the reasons why giving blood is a good idea, and we all think if giving blood is a good idea, right? We all think that. So can we commit to trying in the next month to get out and donate blood? Because a lot of people in the community need it. And I was requested by a friend of mine in BC who works for Canadian Blood Services. She knew I was going to be making a presentation today. She knows that I do community-based social marketing. She knows I often use blood donation as an example. So I would ask you if you could put up your hand, if you could commit in the next month, she said November was going to be really important to get out and give blood. Can you? Anybody else? Okay, thank you. I can tell you that those people who commit, you will feel compelled to do so. You might not all do it, but you'll feel compelled to do so because you've just made a commitment to, to do it. And that's how community-based social marketing works. So I'll talk to you about research and small questions, commitment strategies, prompts, social norms. I just want you also to think that some of these things that, that I've talked about today would apply directly to what Delia was speaking about, what David was speaking about earlier, and, and what other speakers were talking about. When it's behavior related, if you want to get your kids to brush their teeth before they go to bed, then use community-based social marketing techniques to, to foster the behaviors that you want to see. Um, there's my contact information is there. Uh, I don't know if, if uh, these presentations are going to be made available. I think they are, are they? Yeah, on the website or whatever. So um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to contact me. I'd be happy to answer uh, any questions you might have. And if there's time, uh, I'd be happy to now, Mike, if, if there is. For a question. If, if there's any questions, I mean, I know it's 3.30. Okay. Canada Blood Services, um, 1-800-2-DONATE. 
It might be 1888 to donate, but Canada Blood Services. 1800 to donate, I think it is. Anybody else? Getting late in the day. Yeah. All right. Thank you.